Good afternoon, friends. Welcome. Uh, welcome back, better, to the fourth edition of this uh, series, where the series is the fourth, because we started in uh, 2021. And this year, we will offer you the opportunity to follow five different events. This is the first one. And the following I'll uh, schedule as follow. Let me show you briefly just to um, help you understand the level of engagement you are requested. And uh, I have to, to share, yes, of course. Now you should see even in connection, there are 33 people connected in streaming and around the same number in the classroom. So more than 60 people interested in circular in circularity. So circular economy and circularity. But uh, as you can see here, we are offering also uh, different topics, such as the critical mapping, how to create knowledge from the ground, relevant for engineers, but not only engaged in promoting local and global development. Uh, the third uh, appointment is uh, maritime and coastal engineering, natural conservation, climate change mitigation. Uh, look at the date, please. Take notes. I'm, I have to rush a bit in our time to recap everything, but you can read uh, in the left side uh, the right date. The fourth appointment will be focusing on innovative agriculture, soilless techniques and precise aggregation in the regional cooperation context. Um, and finally, the topic of network-based solutions for sustainable cities. In other words, how to manage and to handle the sustainable uh, application of uh, um, the network-based solution in urban context. Um, the spheres usually are mixed, uh, internal and external. Uh, in the sense that we invite uh, every time an external or two external speakers, today two external speakers, and one internal in order to have um, um, the opportunity to present also the activities managed by the DECAN department, the Department of Civil mechanical and environmental engineer. So welcome. Feel free to intervene during the presentation, but we kindly ask to uh, maintain uh, uh, your hand, not lifted, until the speaker have uh, uh, closed the presentation. And let me rush immediately in presenting the first one, because we have three very interesting uh, presentation in contribution tonight. We are recording also the uh, lecture, so you can recover and listen to the speakers back. And don't forget that uh, if you are interested in getting the ECs, one is it is for at the end of this uh, web series, you must pass also the verification. It's a very, very simple examination scheduled in June. And final end will be at uh, 6. Okay? As usual, you must be uh, collaborative and participatory approaches are well appreciated. So you can intervene, offer your uh, remarks, and not necessary questions, but also comments, etc. And today we will speak about uh, the circular economy, but with a special focus on how to apply circular economy and the principle of circularity and sustainable development by circularity to electric engineer and to electric engines. In other words, how to make uh, more sustainable the industrial process in production, distribution, use, and and recycling of um, engines, uh, electric engines. At the end of the use, they become uh, waste. 
in Italy we call NY, within the, the apparecchiature elettriche elettroniche, and in the general context W E E. So I've uh, never heard about this topic. This is the right occasion to get started because there's a lot of demand of professionality. Uh, I can be a uh, witness given I participate in uh, AI in the facilitator in the case studies we'll present with the second speaker. The first one is Luca Fiori, professor, associate professor here. A long, very, very long uh, curriculum. So, Luca, I would like to avoid uh, to uh, miss uh, any or, or more of your uh, great skill experiences. As you say, professor of chemical engineering at the University of Trento, where is the leader of the green processes engineering lab. So, um, great experience not only in substances chemical substances application, but also in processes, how to manage industrial manufacturing, even in managing the supply chain, the global supply chain of the um, electrical and electronic waste. And a lot of other experience that you can demonstrate during your presentation. And the second speaker, is a uh, engineer uh, Alessandro Sartorello from Laffer SPA, a uh, company uh, producing uh, a lot of our engines, uh, electric engines in the Sumitomo Japanese group with the case study presenting how they are introducing circular economy in their processes of production, also in uh, um, design, production, uh, distribution, managing all the supply chain and recycling at the end of the use. And finally, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, um, here on my right, uh, Marco Compagnoni, PhD candidate, right? Uh, in the University of Trento, expert in the circular economy. Um, in, even in this case, I will present you before your presentation. So I uh, want to invite uh, uh, Luca, um, to introduce uh, his presentation. There or here? You can stay here. Okay. Better because if there's like the camera, you can be in, on the TV. Mm, yes. Oh, to the screen. Is it shared? The microphone is muted. Online, online, we don't hear. Uh, the microphone is muted, I think. So what I'm going to introduce you is some uh, basic concept uh, of circular economy and uh, we will talk, uh, we will address uh, the waste from electrical and electronic equipment. <laughs> so, let's say some fundamentals, uh, then uh, the link between uh, circular economy and waste, which, what, what are uh, such a we? and uh, the material which uh, are constituent the, the, the such uh, waste of electronic and electric uh, device, then 
a few, I mean, one slide also with possibility to recover such uh, different uh, materials. So first of all, uh, what is, uh, let's say, circular economy? Here uh, we show just a couple of images uh, in which we have something uh, which looks linear and something which actually is uh, circular. So somehow this line has been uh, closed in itself, and I will explain a little bit about this uh, in, the, in the next uh, slide. So first of all, we have to understand the idea of linear economy, which actually is not, uh, we are not talking of uh, economy, we are talking of uh, a, develop a model of development of uh, society. So let's say this is the typical uh, uh, approach through which we uh, get materials from uh, the environment. It could be the wood in the forest. There could be fossil fuels. Anyway, there could be minerals. And what we typically do is, uh, I mean, uh, our society does, uh, is to extract such uh, natural resources, then transform them, process them, produce product, which are then sold and used by us, and after uses, they became waste. So this is the typical way of producing and consuming stuff. Even if it's a few years that now we change a little bit our mind, because we understood that this, let's say, scheme of societal development cannot be sustainable, because in this way, we continue to use raw material, and we continue to transform them into waste at the end of their life, which is uh, something that makes uh, landfill full of uh, rubbish, which is not uh, good. So let's try to move such a line to make it circular, okay? So what does it mean, this? It means, uh, uh, let's say, to make uh, different uh, uh, steps, different uh, steps in design, in the production, in the distribution, and also the possibility of reuse, of repair the equipment, whatever. It can be equipment, it could be biomass, okay, food. At the end, the idea, I mean, what is done and what should be done even more and more in the future is try to recirculate matter so that something that is nowadays waste can be recycled back as a secondary raw material in such a way minimizing what goes to landfilling, waste, and actually what is needed to our societal system to work. So by recycling back some materials, we will diminish the use, the consumption of raw materials. Okay, this is the idea of the circular economy. Do you think it's, a, it's an example of circular economy or not? So planet obsolescence means uh, since the beginning, to make the product intrinsically weak so that it can be, I mean, uh, it, it will break after a certain time of use and soon it will become uh, a waste. So this is exactly the contrary of the concept at the basis of the circular economy, okay? And actually there was a, 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 an economist that actually uh, theorized this theory I mean, to overcome the issue due to the Great Depression in the US, let's say around 100 years ago, so that, I mean, let's organize the production system in a way to make weak product, product that easily should go to, should become a waste. So actually, this is completely the contrary of the concept of uh, circular economy. So um, a little bit, uh, some more detail on uh, such a circular scheme. 
So to have something that can be actually recirculated in order to recover material, we have to follow different steps. First of all, we have to design the product in a way to make it easily recoverable. My mobile phone nowadays has the battery that cannot be dismantled. Okay, it's a typical example of not circular approach. Once, if you can get rid of your battery, it's, it's a way to make it much more easily recoverable. Okay, so from, even from, from say that the concept of circular economy starts since the design of the product. The car should be designed in a way that you can easily dismantle it and let's say, um, collect, uh, take away, I mean, dismantle plastics, metals, and other stuff. Then there is the production, which should look at trying to avoid waste stream. Then there is the distribution. Now, if we buy something through Amazon, obviously we get a lot of packaging, which is something that makes waste. And then there is also the right to repair the product. Nowadays, it's sometimes cheaper to buy a new washing machine than just to change the, uh, let's say, the, the card, electronic card that get uh, uh, damaged. So because it's so in a way that you can, you have to buy a new product, okay? Not to repair, not to reuse the same product. At the end of the story, in any way, we have something which is a waste, okay? So what we are called to do as citizens is to make separate collection. So these are as we can, let's say, work as citizens, not as engineers. So separate collection. After that, obviously, there will be someone, some companies, which is capable to reprocess the materials, to recite the materials to new life, okay? So in such a way, there are different steps, different actors involved into the chain of the circular economy, of the circular model of societal de development. So, I mean, a few sentences by important people, which clearly demonstrate that uh, such linear economy cannot be sustainable anymore. I can read it very easily. Anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever. In an if in affinity world is either a madman or an economist. Okay. Obviously, we have a finite amount of uh, resources in our finite uh, land, spaceship earth. I mean, uh, <clears throat> recently I read this couple of books, uh, which somehow, I mean, uh, uh, take into consideration what has been published uh, 50 years ago. So if you like to dip uh, the topic of these, uh, let's say, limits of, uh, of the, the way of producing materials, how resources can be depleted, how people, population increase, decrease, the, the amount of material used, the amount of uh, product uh, and waste produced, you can have a look at these uh, relatively easy to read the books, which are not specialized, but anyway, they are, can be read and are interesting. So we are talking of an economic model. We are talking of uh, a systematic change to transform our way of living. We have to decouple, let's say, economic growth. That means uh, the, uh, the growth in terms of uh, uh, well-being should be decoupled from consumption. So this is a classical uh, point uh, which we have to focus on. We cannot rely only on producing more and more and more. Okay. And let's say other sentences that I'm not going to read. Uh, I mean, more or less, this, the, the idea is the same. So when we talk uh, about, uh, let's say, uh, materials, uh, um, also um, production cycle, we can face two different uh, fields. One, it's related 
to let's say technical cycles i'm talking about uh, something related to plastic something related to metals everything which is not alive okay so i mean the mobile the mobile phone the pc or whatever which is rich in metals in inorganics in plastics and then there is another portion to which we belong as human beings, which is the biosphere. So the circular economy and the waste, which are linked to the biosphere. That means we are talking about food, we are talking about food waste, we are talking about uh, what can be done with such organic waste, biogas, compost, and stuff like that. So obviously when we talk about WEE, we are talking about technical cycle. But we have to take in, into account that there are technical cycle and biological cycle related to the biosphere. So here, I mean, I took a few pictures just to explain you some example of a circular and non-circular cases. So it's quite clear that the nature is by itself, the nature is by nature circular. So the waste are an invention of human beings, okay? If we say that the nature is circular, if we say that, that waste as a product of human beings, I will ask you, what do you think about such a picture in which we see a plant? Which kind of plant it is, first of all? You can say, I can, I can repeat for the audience uh, following uh, online. What is this? What do you think? Not here. Eh? This could be. Okay, yeah, yes, I didn't Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is a refinery. And uh, I mean, uh, if it treats fossil fuels, it means uh, petroleum, obviously it will not represent an example of circular economy because we are using something which is finite, which is, uh, I mean, uh, petroleum can use also other I mean, fossil fuels, typically it uses petroleum to produce plastics, to produce uh, gasoline, to produce uh, diesel, uh, to produce uh, stuff like that. But if instead of feeding it with fossil fuels, if we feed it with bio waste, it could become an example of circular economy. Obviously, obviously taking into account that at the end, we do not have to produce uh, important amount of waste. No, everything should be looked uh, with a, a life cycle analysis approach, okay? Because uh, <clears throat> in general, I mean, it, it could be also difficult to say completely green, completely not, okay? But anyway, this the same scheme, uh, now in Italy, we are really good in biorefinery. Now we have a uh, an historical background about uh, petrochemical industry, and now some of them are moving to biorefineries. We have example in Sardinia, we have example in uh, Mestre. So when we talk about, uh, let's move to waste now. Waste uh, means, uh, I mean, something that we want to avoid. So first of all, we have to, I mean, we, we say the law of three, four, five R. Why this, this number of R? The first R is a reduction. We have to reduce the use of, of uh, let's say, raw material. That means prevention, minimization. We have to reuse the same material more than once. I can reuse the glass to, re to, to refill it with wine. I can reuse the PC because it's not any more any, any more good for me. It can be used by my kids, for instance. Then recycling. Recycling is what we do when we do separate collection and what companies do when they treat uh, the material from separate collection. Even if, if we do manage to reach this, uh, this uh, recycling step, that means recovery of material, we can at least try to recover energy. Okay, so 
through combustion, typically. The, the worst is disposed, is landfilling. So, which is the connect connection between circular economy and waste? I mean, this is the typical Dolomite, Dolomite Ambiente scheme for separate collection. So we, through circular economy, we try to avoid residual matter. We try to avoid things to go to Ischiapodetti, to landfill, things to go to incinerator. This is the Bolzano uh, incinerator. Let's move a little bit to electric and electronic equipment. What, what are they there? They are PC, they are, uh, I mean, everything we use in our everyday life. This is equipment. After use, they became waste. So we, okay, so we can have domestic waste, the one we produce, we can have professional waste, the one that the company produce, okay? So if we go to Centro Raccolta Materiali, no, you can find different place to uh, dispose of uh, a fridge, to dispose of uh, a oven, to dispose of uh, lamps. Okay, so different categorization of uh, we. The same uh, applies, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this was at uh, it Italian sc scale, this is European scale, but the same applies. Then uh, what we can say, Every year, each of us produce roughly 12 kilogram of WE, out of which half are recovered, say kilogram per inhabitants, okay? What's happened to this WE? Eh, they can go to landfilling, they can be recovered, they can be exported, okay? Different options, something nice for us, for the environment, something much less. So we can have example of a nice case in Africa, China, bad case of uses of, of I mean, we can also use these uh, underdeveloped or in developing, developing countries, unfortunately as bees, which is the case which is not at all nice. Anyway, a few words about materials. In electronic waste, what we find, plastics, glass, metals, and chemical compounds, among which an important category is represented by the so-called critical raw materials, which are materials which are critical for the EU development, okay? So, I mean, in we, we have a lot of them. So it will be much beneficial to recover them because, I mean, if we look for them in mines, we can see that the concentration is much, much lower than in we this is an example of the amount of metals in a mobile mobile phone so what we can do i mean what is already done we don't have to invent a lot there are already companies doing their job and making money from this waste management and collect management after collection what they do I mean, they have to destroy typically the equipments and then to make a separate, uh, to separate between metals, thermomagnetic, non ferromagnetic, plastic and glasses. And then obviously there are some products, some materials that can be recovered, some other that cannot be, cannot be. And anyway, this is the normal path. I was, uh, I mean, uh, coordinating a couple of projects as a University of Trento units, uh, devoted to, let's say, making people aware about these possibilities. And with students, we went to Milan to see Relight, which is a company specialized in the use and recycling of screens. I think this is the answer. No, no, this is the answer of my talk. Just, uh, I mean, uh, thank you for your attention and, uh, we managed to solve some issue with PC. So I'm working with you now, which I don't know which one to look at. But anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and maybe question at the end, maybe now it's- uh, Best of the Yeah, um, okay. In order to expect the time share for the other speaker. Thank you so much, Luca. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, friends. Um, keep note of your questions, uh, curiosities, etc. Now it's the time to present uh, Alessandro Sartorello. It's an electrical engineer, graduated at the University of Padua. Now is the head of the research and development unit at Laffert SPA, a company, as I said before, engaged in producing uh, electric engines of uh, several uh, size, um, distributing all around the world from, for different purposes. So he will explain everything about the company with a very short introduction, but the focus will be on a case studies on how to apply the principle um, explained by Luca, how to apply it to a specific uh, supply chain, to a specific process, industrial process, and what could be the role not only of designers or producers, but also, for instance, uh, economists uh, and other professional profiles engaged uh, in recovering materials, in reintroducing them in the supply chain uh, by building up a business model, but also helping all the around the world uh, customer to recover. So introducing behavioral uh, practices useful in order to avoid the disposal and with a very critical disposal of the uh, engines at the end of this. Um, that said, um, Alessandro, you have the floor. You can share your uh, presentation and you already are uh, presenting. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Massimo. I think so, you can see the presentation. for you. Please. <clears throat> so, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, just... Uh, uh, sorry. Yes. Probably C you can, can you hear me? Today. Now? Try to speak, please. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Go. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alessandro Sartorello. Um, I am an electrical engineer and I joined Laffert in 2007, just after the graduation as a, an R&D engineer. And I'm currently the head of R&D. My focus is especially on the electromagnetic design of uh, permanent magnet uh, synchronous motors. That is uh, one of the two motor types that Laffert uh, is uh, producing. Uh, just a quick presentation about the Laffert group. Uh, Laffert is an electric uh, motor motors manufacturer, uh, especially for uh, uh, industrial applications. Um, it was founded in uh, uh, 1962 and uh, um, is uh, uh, committed especially to uh, realize uh, um, personalized and customized solutions according to uh, the customer needs. Some uh, figures uh, from a Laffer group, uh, the turnover is uh, um, higher than 230 million euros. Uh, we have more than uh, 1,100 employees and we produce uh, uh, around uh, 1.2 million uh, motors uh, each year. Uh, the headquarter is in San Dona di Piave, uh, close to Venice. And we have another three manufacturing plants in Italy, one in Slovenia and one in China and uh, uh, plus uh, to other uh, commercial uh, um, sales uh, offices uh, around uh, the world. Since um, 2018, um, Laffert is part of uh, uh, a Japanese uh, um, giant, the Sumitomo Heavy Industries. And uh, actually in, in Sumitomo, Laffert uh, is uh, currently the global competence center for uh, uh, the electric motors. To summarize uh, what, is, uh, what are the products that the Laffert is uh, producing, uh, as said, Laffert uh, was founded in uh, 1962 
and uh, started uh, uh, producing uh, asynchronous motors for uh, industrial applications, uh, especially for uh, uh, pumps and fans, um, with a power range uh, uh, from uh, below one kilowatt to around uh, 30 kilowatt. Then uh, in the 1990s, um, we developed uh, the servo motors uh, range uh, that are based on the permanent magnet uh, synchronous uh, uh, motor topology. Then in uh, 2000, uh, we launched uh, the so-called HP uh, product that is uh, the merging between the two technologies, meaning that uh, we have uh, the same mechanics of uh, asynchronous uh, uh, motors, but inside uh, they are permanent magnet uh, motors and uh, they are applied to the same uh, applications uh, uh, of uh, asynchronous motors, but uh, uh, the benefits are especially in the uh, highest efficiency that can be achieved thanks to uh, this uh, uh, motor uh, topology. Then in the subsequent years, uh, we have developed uh, also other uh, solutions such as uh, for uh, the ventilation, for the big fan, for the lift, for the AGV, and, I, and they are all based on the uh, permanent magnet uh, technology. In terms of uh, sales, um, the majority of sales, as you can see, um, are out of uh, Italy. So um, almost 75% uh, of the motors are sold outside uh, Italy. Um, in terms of uh, product uh, um, type, um, you see that uh, uh, actually the blue part uh, is a servo motors, the green part is a, a permanent magnet motors for other applications. And uh, in total, okay, uh, they are all permanent magnet uh, motors that uh, uh, are uh, almost uh, equally um, the same, that have the equally the same quantity as the uh, asynchronous motors. Uh, in terms of applications, uh, Lafferty is uh, um, present uh, in the DHVAC and pumps in uh, industrial automation, robotics, in uh, uh, vacuum pumps and compressors, in the wind energy generation, and uh, in material handling. The customers typically are OEMs and system integrators, meaning um, companies that are um, producing machines or equipments in which the motor is installed, or companies that are uh, selling solutions, uh, so um, in which the motor is uh, part of uh, the complete package. The approach of Laffert is uh, to develop uh, the motor together with the customer, uh, so with a co-engineering approach. This uh, leads to a high level of product uh, customization, uh, in terms of electromagnetic and also in terms of mechanical uh, design and also to uh, um, a big uh, um, variety of uh, products uh, in, in, in production. In terms of uh, sustainability, uh, Laffert actually is uh, uh, committed uh, toward uh, sustainability. Um, for example, um, Laffert is uh, certified uh, according to the uh, ISO uh, 14001 for the environment management. We are registered um, at RAE, it is uh, uh, we in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in English, as uh, uh, Luca said before, and uh, we are part of uh, APIRAE consortium. Uh, for uh, the management of uh, uh, the waste uh, of the, um, the product at, at the end of the life. Since 2021, uh, Laffert also uh, draws up uh, the sustainability report uh, that uh, actually is a, a report uh, um, concerning the economic, uh, environmental and social uh, issues. 
and uh, to take into account that uh, uh, for Laffert it's not uh, mandatory to um, make this report, uh, but uh, actually it is done on a voluntary basis. Um, this is uh, again to 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 demonstrate uh, uh, the, the the commitment that the Laffert has toward the sustainability. Um, furthermore, um, we have also in place a sustainability plan that has been approved for the 2023-2026, uh, where uh, um, some uh, concrete actions and targets have been identified, actually 82, that are grouped uh, in nine uh, pillars covering um, people, governance, and uh, uh, environment. About the Laffert uh, products, um, they are also uh, committed toward sustainability uh, because they are high energy uh, efficiency products. Uh, so the, the, le the efficiency level is uh, uh, the highest in, in, the, in the market. So it means uh, lower energy consumption and uh, CO2 um, emissions. Uh, and also they are very compact products. Uh, it means uh, uh, reduced uh, space and weight. And uh, this implies uh, also uh, a less uh, um, material usage. So for example, uh, iron and, uh, and copper. So uh, the portfolio includes uh, I3 three phase and I2 single phase asynchronous motors that are currently uh, mandatory, um, so required by the regulations. But uh, Laffert has also uh, recently developed the I4 uh, three phase asynchronous motors, so beyond uh, what are required by the regulations. We have uh, I5 uh, permanent magnet uh, uh, rare earth based uh, synchronous motors and also ultra compact uh, servo motor permanent uh, servo permanent magnet motors to be noticed that uh, there is a, a, a growing demand for uh, this kind of uh, characteristics so uh, to have uh, um, more efficient motors and uh, uh, with a higher compactness so uh, the products are developed to to catch uh, this trend uh, in the market The combination of uh, the motor with the uh, uh, variable speed drive leads uh, to a further uh, significant energy saving. That's why Laffert is combining uh, his product also with the uh, with drive. And uh, also uh, a comment uh, regarding rare earth permanent magnet motors. So as you um, have seen, uh, many products uh, from Laffert are based on uh, rare earth permanent magnets. Uh, that uh, uh, are including um, so um, materials like uh, neodymium or dysprosium. This uh, leads to high performance and uh, especially uh, to an higher compactness and uh, a lower uh, weight. This is beneficial actually, uh, not only because of the performances, but uh, also because uh, this allows uh, a less uh, uh, material usage in terms of, for example, of copper and iron, and also in terms of uh, logistics as uh, um, a lower weight is beneficial for the transportation. However, they are critical uh, raw materials according to uh, the European Union. Um, and uh, the main reasons are that uh, there is a concern, first of all, for their environmental impact as uh, um, their mining and their subsequent uh, refining process has uh, uh, a big impact on the environment. And the other issue is that uh, um, there are geopolitical uh, concerns because China has the monopoly actually of this uh, kind of uh, uh, materials with the risks in terms of supply chain and also for uh, the um, um, volatile costs. So about the circular 
um, economy. We uh, did a, a project uh, last year, uh, a training plan of uh, uh, 700 hours funded by uh, Fondi Impresa uh, that uh, have involved 60 employees in Laffert, uh, subdivided into 11 technical groups. Uh, we had uh, frontal lessons, but also sessions with uh, uh, open discussion uh, about uh, uh, ideas to improve uh, the circular economy in, in Laffert. All functions have been involved, so engineering, production, and uh, supply chain. And uh, the, the, the main targets were to raise the awareness about uh, the circular economy uh, in Laffert, and also to um, have a concrete implementation of the indications that are included in the uh, sustainability plan in a, an organized uh, manner. These are some of the topics that uh, have been covered during um, uh, the, the project. Actually, they are uh, um, the topics that uh, are uh, closer to, to, to my function and, and my role in, in, in Laffert. So uh, first of all, for example, the, the, the packaging solutions. Actually, in Laffert, uh, we have uh, we already have the multi-packaging solution and the uh, reusable packaging that are plastic uh, boxes that uh, um, are returned to Laffert after the motor are shipped to the customer. But uh, they are uh, limited uh, cases. And uh, for sure, um, there is uh, uh, the possibility to expand uh, uh, these um, uh, methods to also other customers uh, and uh, uh, other uh, motors. The, the main issue, the problem is that uh, uh, these uh, solutions can be applied uh, when the um, batch is uh, uh, large. So um, many motors uh, all uh, of the same dimension and, uh, and uh, shape. Uh, so what prevents the uh, massive adoption of these methods is that uh, we have a big variety in production, many, many variants. So this is uh, something to be considered and uh, uh, if uh, we want to improve this, uh, this aspect. Another uh, important topic is the repair of the motors. Uh, in this moment, Laffert uh, as a service department and where um, around 1% of the motors are repaired. So uh, they are motors that the customer um, ship back to, to, to Laffert um, for, uh, for repair. Especially um, they are servo motors and the reason is that uh, the servo motors is uh, uh, an higher um, value uh, product. So um, the, the cost of the repair is uh, um, felt uh, convenient by, by the customer. So if uh, the higher the value of the product and uh, the more convenient is for the customer, um, the repair. Uh, now we have only 1% and to increase this uh, this uh, percentage so to to encourage also the our customers to uh, ship back the motors to to Laffert for the repair is that uh, um, we have to first of all uh, uh, reduce the cost for the repair it means uh, that uh, we have to introduce some automation for the, the disassembly and also um, we have to think uh, to uh, improve uh, the repairability of, uh, of the motor means that uh, it must be easier to, to disassemble uh, the motor to, to, to be repaired. Differentiation of uh, metal scraps. Uh, actually, uh, Laffert uh, is doing uh, this in production. 
95% um, of uh, the scrap in production is metal scrap, coming especially from uh, the punching for uh, the lamination of stator and rotor, and from shavings of uh, uh, machinings, for example, of, uh, of the shafts and uh, the other uh, components. Uh, actually, this scrap is uh, um, sent and handled by um, some scrap companies that uh, are uh, actually shredding uh, the scraps to um, to 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 send uh, to send it to the steel companies and that can reuse this uh, this uh, scrap. Uh, an improvement improvement to this uh, is to um, reduce uh, this uh, scrap. So um, if, for example, um, about the punching, so to reduce uh, uh, the scrap material uh, during the punching, it means to uh, think about uh, new technologies that uh, um, Laffert uh, actually is uh, currently uh, in already introducing such as uh, the so-called uh, uh, segmented technology that allows to reduce uh, uh, the punching um, scrap and also to optimize uh, uh, the shafts, okay? The, the, the shape of the, of the shafts uh, because uh, um, the shafts are now um, uh, uh, machined from, uh, from a bar, okay? And because of the different uh, diameters, there is uh, some uh, some scrap after uh, after the process. Um, so in order to reduce this scrap, uh, we we should have uh, um, a shaft uh, with the same diameter, ideally. But of course, this is uh, uh, in this moment not possible. And uh, to do this, uh, we have to review. Um, the, the specification from, uh, from uh, the customer. And so this is a, a discussion uh, with the customer and also to increase its awareness of, uh, of the choices. So when they send a specification that this uh, uh, has an impact also on, on the scrap and so also on, uh, um, on the waste uh, in the environment. About uh, uh, the motor topology, uh, the uh, attention is actually on the development of solution that can avoid uh, uh, the rare earth uh, permanent magnets because they are uh, they include uh, critical uh, materials such as uh, neodymium and dysprosium. One choice is to use uh, ferrite instead of uh, rare earth magnets, so a different permanent magnet material. And uh, another choice is to avoid um, the permanent magnets at all. Um, so using a different uh, principle to generate a torque, such as uh, in the synchronous lactance motor. Uh, they are solutions that of course uh, are beneficial in terms of supply chain and uh, environment, but actually they uh, uh, imply a compromise in terms of uh, performances and uh, uh, dimensions uh, and weight as uh, their torque density is not uh, the same as uh, um, the motors with the uh, rare earth permanent magnets. So uh, you need uh, a bigger motor to do the same uh, performances. Other uh, possibilities is to increase uh, the motor lifetime uh, using higher quality materials. Uh, for example, uh, currently in the motor, there is a, a class F uh, insulation material that can withstand uh, uh, 150 degrees. So switching to a class H, it means uh, 180 degrees. Um, there is a, um, a beneficial uh, effect uh, in terms of uh, deterioration of the insulation material. So uh, the lifetime of the motor can be increased. Or uh, we can think to oversize the motor, meaning that uh, the motor is, uh, is bigger 
and these uh, leads to lower uh, temperatures inside the motor uh, at the same uh, performances and uh, lower temperatures means uh, less deterioration of materials and so an increased uh, lifetime. Another um, solution is to make uh, um, the disassembly uh, of the motors uh, and the separation of components uh, easier or uh, automatic in order to, to repair or to recycle uh, the materials. Um, actually, uh, this is uh, also a, a challenge. And um, for example, in order to um, make uh, easier the disassembly of uh, the permanent magnets, uh, we should avoid the use of, uh, of the glue and uh, make uh, other uh, systems to, to fix uh, the magnets. For example, this, is, this could be uh, a possibility. Another, another um, scenario is to um, uh, exploit the Industry 4.0 technologies that uh, um, are based on, uh, um, on putting more sensor on the motor and to monitor uh, its uh, behavior during um, the working conditions. This uh, uh, would allow to um, having more data uh, during uh, the, the, the working of, of the motor that can prevent fatal failure. So to, um, for a, an easier repair of the motor before a, a fatal failure, or, or also to uh, have an easier analysis uh, for the root cause of, of the failure when the motor is uh, returning to tool effort for, uh, for the repair. As uh, uh, in this moment, uh, the analysis of uh, the motor that uh, comes back from the field is very time consuming. Also a stronger cooperation with the supplier and scrap companies uh, can help uh, um, the circular um, economy concept um, as, for example, um, having more data about uh, the, the materials that are uh, supplied by um, the suppliers, okay, and that are, can be produced in a more sustainable uh, way or that can be, um, that, that can come from, uh, from recycles. And about uh, Recycled materials, um, talking about uh, rare earth magnets, okay? One way is to recover the magnets from uh, uh, scrap rotors in, uh, in production or uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, the customers. Uh, this is actually not done because, uh, again, it's uh, quite uh, difficult because uh, especially of uh, the realization of uh, and the construction of the rotor that uh, are using the glue, for example. But this, um, if uh, this process uh, is possible, can allow the uh, preservation of the value of, uh, um, of the magnets that can be sent uh, uh, to some uh, scrap companies that actually are promoting uh, them uh, in, in Europe to, to, to provide this service to recycle uh, the rare earth magnets. And then of course, uh, this uh, will allow to develop also a supply chain in Europe where uh, we maybe in the future, we will be able to use uh, uh, recycled uh, rare earth magnets that uh, currently again are produced only, only in China. So coming to the conclusion, um, to reinforce uh, the circular economy in Laffert, uh, we are thinking to new motor topologies that can avoid uh, the use of rare earth magnets. Um, we are evaluating new technologies, uh, for example, um, for the punching or uh, uh, for the, the condition uh, monitoring during um, 
the working of, uh, of the motor. Another, again, another uh, scenario is to increase the repairability and the disassembly uh, of the motors. Um, so thinking from uh, the beginning of the design to the possibility for a, an easy uh, repair and disassembly. To consider the use of uh, recycled materials and also to increase the awareness uh, of uh, uh, about uh, these uh, topics, for example, um, through um, a logo, a Laffert circular logo, that can increase the awareness, uh, not only in Laffert, uh, but also um, on the customer side and uh, on the supplier side. The main challenges are uh, the managing of the huge number of products, uh, variants, uh, and the eye customization Laffert has uh, in this moment because, uh, uh, for example, this prevent uh, uh, the standardization of uh, the packaging solutions, for example, or uh, an automatic uh, uh, disassembly of the motor for, for the repair. The risk of higher costs, because, uh, for example, uh, motor oversizing or uh, the increase of the quality of the materials to increase the lifetime can lead to uh, higher costs that can be uh, not accepted by the market. And uh, in this way, um, we need to balance uh, what is the um, perception of the customer about uh, um, the, uh, the motivation for, uh, for uh, an higher cost. So uh, we have to transfer to, to, to the customer the uh, higher value of uh, a product that is uh, uh, designed and realized according to uh, circular economy principles. And uh, also the supportive uh, contribution of uh, the supply chain and uh, the, the suppliers, because uh, uh, Laffert cannot uh, uh, recycle, of course, the, the, the materials. So uh, we need support from the supply chain in order to to use uh, uh, recycled materials and to have uh, this possibility uh, available, uh, for example, uh, for the permanent magnets. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessandro. The... Main finding probably is that a systemic approach is needed. Uh, as said also uh, Luca, is depending not only one of the actors of the supply chain, it doesn't depend on one uh, uh, design manager, but uh, it's a, a game the whole team must play. And in perfect continuity, we can go on by analyzing now the economic aspects and in terms of business models, but also in terms of economic systems uh, in society, and, and also uh, taking care about the impacts generated by the bad management of the supply chain. And as uh, Alessandro uh, underlined, it's not only an issue on how to manage the waste of engines, but also the main production aspects during the production. It's also my direct experience. Uh, circular economy must be applied in all the stages of the life cycle of the product, from the raw material uh, collection to the production design, uh, logistics management, uh, storage, and all the uh, the life during the use of the the engine. Now. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Marco Compagnoni, a uh, researcher, postdoc, uh, PhD candidate here in Trento, Sustainable Economics Management, Environment, Society. So um, the complexity and the interdisciplinarity is inside this program of uh, PhD. But uh, now new experience in University of Pavia, right? Bicocca, Milano Bicocca, sorry. And engaged in a specific uh, 
field of the environmental issues related to technological and the energy transition. So um, really an expert in circular economy in waste and uh, in this case. So uh, Marco, come here. You have the floor. I don't see the whole uh, things here, but I think it's enough in the meanwhile. Let's see. No, it's the Okay, here we go. Okay, right. Yeah, thank you very much, Massimo, for uh, for the presentation and for the invitation. Last year, I I followed uh, the ESC seminar and was uh, very interested in interesting. So very nice to be here from this side uh, this year. Um, yeah, I would like to start my my presentation from uh, from an expression. No, 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 Okay, yeah, okay, so hopefully uh, the presentation is going to go circular actually because I'm going to repeat uh, many of the things that uh, Luca already said, but uh, hopefully with a bit of a different twist uh, and um, not to make you too bored, even if also because it's a uh, Aperitivo time now, and um, and I'm also going to talk about some examples that actually uh, also Alessandro talked about. So uh, hopefully uh, we have something uh, something new. I would like to start the presentation from a from a, an expression that uh, it's already in this uh, slide, even of in the in the in the title that is a sustainable development. Um, so economists and uh, other scholars discussed for, for long, what are the factors that make economies uh, grow, as well as what are the factors that uh, make a uh, growth path sustainable or not. So definitely nature and uh, resources, the availability of natural resources has been recognized as a, a factor allowing uh, economies to grow. And not only historically, resources allowed for the, the development of industrial systems, but even today, the most advanced economies are those that are consuming, uh, unfortunately, the highest rate of, uh, of raw materials. Um, we uh, are not used to, to see this aspect because the, uh, we are used to consume or to use uh, uh, small objects, which uh, actually are, are very uh, complex today, like smartphones and so on. They contain a huge variety of raw materials, which are typically not extracted in, uh, in developed countries. So we do not tend to see uh, both the impact, uh, the environmental impact of, uh, of our consumption uh, choices and of how the technological system has 
uh, evolved. Uh, here on the left is a photo that I uh, took myself from uh, uh, Carrara. Uh, so this is Carrara marble and it's pretty impressive uh, uh, site because you really see a top of mountains that have been removed in order to extract uh, uh, the materials. So the issue here is that resources, of course, are sometimes uh, uh, non-renewable or sometimes they are renewable, but at a slow rate. Uh, and so this is uh, an issue. Second point is that nature, so the second uh, constraint to economic growth, uh, is that nature has a limited ability to absorb the wastes of human activities, where waste can be considered both as uh, garbage, but also uh, in terms of uh, any kind, more generally, as any kind of uh, uh, pollution uh, that is generated by human consumption and production processes. Here on the left, what you see, and also the extraction of raw materials has huge environmental as well as social impacts. What you see on the, on the left is a, a picture of uh, 20 years ago, almost, of uh, an ex uh, mine of rare earths, that now you all know, in, uh, in China. And the problem here is that uh, uh, huge amounts of, uh, of water are, are needed and this the, the extraction of rare earths also bring uh, also um, brings out um, uh, radioactive materials. So it has a huge environmental uh, impact. Uh, so if we need to, to go, the question has always been, how do we go in the direction of a sustainable development path? Well, the answer is, the answer typically has been technology uh, and uh, technological progress. Techno technological progress allows to use resources, natural resources in a, more, in a more efficient way. 20 years ago, the dominant technology for uh, uh, televisions, just to stay in the electronics field, was cathode ray tube. So we had very heavy, big uh, devices with relatively high concentrations of uh, um, uh, heavy metals, for example. Then we moved to uh, flat panels, much lighter, which means uh, a saving of, uh, of uh, natural resources and lower contents of pollutant resources. And now uh, televisions, especially from the younger generations, tend to be substituted by tablets and, and, uh, and uh, uh, laptops, which uh, are devices that allow to perform a variety of uh, functions. So we are in the domain of what is called a uh, a technological convergence, which also allows to put on the market a decreasing number of, uh, of devices. Then technological progress allows to switch from the use of more scarce or pollutant resources to others. For example, think about the technologies that, are, that allow to, uh, to switch from, uh, from the use of uh, uh, fossil fuels to renewable energies. And then Techno technological progress, uh, techno modern technologies also allow to substitute intangible solutions to tangible solutions for the satisfaction of customers' needs. Uh, typical example, pretty silly in my opinion, is uh, the case of Spotify or Netflix, uh, which allows to substitute uh, CDs, DVDs, and the specific hardware that you needed to perform them. So the answer for sustainable development is uh, technology and uh, to speed up uh, technological innovation? Probably yes, but we must be aware that there are some, some issues. And um, I'm not gonna talk about uh, uh, electricity consumption, but that's definitely an issue. And another one that we already talked about is uh, ele electronic waste. Uh, without going too much, uh, without repeating ourselves uh, too much, electronic waste, uh, uh, is a relevant environmental issue because it's one of the fastest growing flows worldwide, contains um, hazardous, uh, is an hazardous waste because it contains very pollutant uh, materials. And globally, less than 20% of uh, uh, electronic waste generated um, is correctly uh, collected and treated. In Europe, which are uh, one of the most advanced uh, uh, countries and regions in the management of electronic waste, we are about around 45%. So, bene ma non benissimo, we would say better, but uh, not very, very well. Here you have some, some data from the United Nations. So, the issue is that uh, where is uh, more than 80% of uh, electronic waste uh, going? 
it's going into unsorted ways, meaning that uh, there might be um, it's not treated in the in the correct way. Uh, there might be that there are um, illicit flows, trade flows going to developing countries where it is treated with uh, uh, without safety and environmental conditions, uh, generating impacts. Um, uh, and huge, huge environmental impacts, and uh, all of these entails that are huge uh, and, and uh, a huge of uh, a huge loss of resources. Another issue is the one of uh, critical raw materials. So uh, many of the modern technologies are based on uh, materials, raw materials, minerals that are uh, supplied globally by one or very few countries. Okay, this is the list and the map provided by the European Union. And on the left, you have some of the technologies in which these materials are contained. So you can already understand that these materials are fundamental for very important uh, um, uh, economic uh, uh, economic sectors, as well as to achieve a very important political uh, um, targets such as de decarbonization. Okay, so here I put uh, up. Uh, um, to give a more concrete example, the case of uh, um, electric engines. So as we learned from the previous presentation from Alessandro, a, a key component of uh, electric engines are permanent magnets, which contain, which contain the so-called rare earths, and this prosium, neodymium, praseodymium. Okay, so uh, you might think, what is this problem of uh, uh, criticality? It is the fact that when the supply is... Uh, uh, concentrated in, a, in the hands of one or very few countries, there might be um, very important events of price volatility, which is what you see on top left of the of the slide. So, exactly on red, precisely on rare earths uh, around the 2011, there was a huge increase of the prices of of rare earths going up from four to more than ten times in just a few weeks. Okay, so this is a huge risk, as also Alessandro said. Uh, for uh, uh, the companies and the value chains that are uh, producing this kind of uh, of technologies. An aspect that uh, uh, sometimes is a bit uh, neglected is the fact that some countries, and again, we are mostly talking about China, do not only control the supply of, uh, so the extraction of these materials, but they also controlling the production of the components that then enter in the final device, in the final technology. This is a very relevant issue from uh, an economic point of view in terms of uh, uh, industrial policy, because for example, the European Union is trying to support the development of a uh, uh, European um, sector of, uh, of batteries, for example, and of uh, microchips. Uh, the problem is that it's not that easy to reinforce uh, European value chains in these technologies, because we might also, we might even lack the knowledge to develop and to produce those components because even the components are produced uh, somewhere else. Okay, so uh, I don't go again, I don't repeat uh, what the circular economy is, but we understood that the prevention of waste is uh, one of the, is one among the, the, the key aspect of a, of a circular economy. And waste prevention can uh, be looked at from, from different angles. So to say one of the levels of, uh, to which uh, look at the waste prevention is uh, the product level. So here we're talking about the design and the introduction of environmental features into uh, a, a product. So uh, the idea here is that is to design uh, a device, a product from the beginning with the aim to make it more um, easier to extend its, uh, its lifetime, to include in its production uh, the recycled materials and so on. So the key uh, regulation here is uh, the, at European level is the Ecodesign Directive of 2009, then updated um, once again, as we saw in the previous presentation. A thing on which uh, the, the European Union is working on now is the digital, digital passport, which is basically a um, do document which will follow the product through its whole uh, lifetime, saying what types of materials are contained, pollutant, non-pollutant, how it's designed and so on. For sure, this is going to be introduced on uh, on batteries. Once again, a key um, technology for the energy transition. There is also discussion on the on the right to um, to repair. 
I go quite quick now because we are, <laughs> we are already late. Another approach to look at uh, um, waste prevention is to look at uh, waste prevention from a multi stakeholders perspective. So basically, each production process, uh, each industrial process generates uh, some intended output and some unintended output. So something that uh, is going to go wasted. wasted. Um, the idea of industrial symbiosis is to, to try to develop uh, either internally or with the collaboration with other uh, companies and production plants uh, a sharing of uh, of these uh, byproducts. It must be, for example, uh, water flows, must be uh, some kind of byproduct that you don't need and for you, for, for your company would be a, a, a waste and so a, a cost while it is needed as in factor in another uh, production process. Yeah. Sooner or later, technologies die and they become waste. We you already know everything. Uh, the key, uh, let's say, uh, regulatory uh, regulation here is uh, so-called extended producer responsibility. So already 20 years ago at the European Union level, that this principle of extended producer responsibility has been uh, introduced. The idea is to make the producers of electronics responsible for the management of their own waste after, uh, the, after that a, a consumer uh, has uh, finished to use it. So basically when the product becomes a waste. The idea here, so the rationale behind this kind of regulation is the fact that uh, is, um, um, yeah, you not only want to improve uh, the waste management of electronic waste, but the idea is that if I make a, pro, uh, a manufacturer of electronic devices responsible, um, economically responsible for the management of their waste, probably they're going to innovate more, they're going to invest in eco-design. So they will, try, they will try to prevent the generation of that waste. In reality, uh, it didn't go exactly in this way. The positive effects of this regulation are more in the, in the downstream side, so in waste management. In any case, we are still facing some limitations. First, first of all, the, 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 it's, it is true that uh, uh, the, the recycling rates of electronic waste uh, are pretty high, but also the the, um, the say the demand for critical materials uh, that is satisfied that is satisfied by uh, recycled critical raw materials is very low and in many ca many cases is uh, even negligible. Look at lithium, the last one in this uh, in this uh, list, and rare earths. Just to talk again about the same group of materials. Uh, we are talking about three to eight percent. Okay, I'll leave you with this. Uh, uh, that is basically here is I think we are working on now. It's basically the the number of patents uh, brevetti. So we are trying to somehow look at innovation in the recycling of rare earths. And two things so we can see. First of all, China. What uh, from 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 this data, what we can see is that China is not only dominating the the extraction of rare earths and these materials. But it's also the one that is, is also the country is more active, probably in uh, in the recycling of this uh, of these materials. Uh, a second and worrying aspect is the fact that all the other countries that you see here, so Europe, EPO, Japan, US, are on a declining trend. So the innovation in this field is uh, a bit um, <laughs> slow, let's say. So I just leave you with this and with a general comment or going back to the, to the starting of the presentation that is basically that we are responsible for the environmental climate crisis in which uh, we are. And so we need to find a solution. If we think that uh, speeding up uh, technological progress is the solution, which might be and hopefully it is, then we need to think uh, uh, responsibly trying to, first of all, to understand what are the environmental as well as geopolitical impacts or consequences of the way in which we direct uh, technologies and innovation. And um, yeah, and to to innovate in a, in a responsible way uh, in consideration of this. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. Much, Marco.
I think that uh, at the end of this uh, lecture, we can open a brief discussion. My first remarks, so let me break the ice, is that uh, uh, the, a, a lot of professional engagement in several different disciplines is required, not only from the engineering side, but also the other professional profile, even legal profile. I'm a lawyer and I have seen with very high pleasure you were quoting uh, the production, the low production in the European Union about the recycling and all the other approaches. But uh, even engineering, the, the huge range of professional uh, different profiles, chemicals, engineers are needed, uh, in electrical and electronic engineer, uh, of course, environmental engineer, but also industrial engineering in general are required. So uh, all the team can be involved. That's place for everybody. And um, now, uh, even from the audience connected by internet, we can open a brief debate, some question. Let me collect. Anyone interested? Now, let me close here. I'm going on this way. We have uh, um, still 32 people connected. Including uh, uh, Susanna here <laughs> and the speaker Alessandro. Uh, any question, friends? Remarks? What about the proposals? And technology. It's a key point for the transition. This is not fast is uh, the key point. Because, uh, I mean, it's not enough uh, to know the solution if we then, we do not decide uh, to use this solution. So, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm an engineer, so I like processes. <clears throat> yeah, no, I was saying that, uh, I mean, technology, it's, uh, it's for sure something really relevant uh, on uh, the circular economy development uh, and for a more sustainable development of society. But I'm sure that it's uh, for sure not enough uh, for solving the issue, for solving the problems. Because, uh, I mean, uh, we have to have an involvement uh, of us in terms of citizens, not in terms of uh, engineers or uh, scientists. Uh, we need uh, from citizens, maybe we can move uh, politics uh, to opt for these, uh, I mean, uh, de decisions that can be also expensive at, at the beginning, at first, at, at least. So, I mean, we have to look at different uh, aspects, uh, uh, sociological aspect, communication aspect, uh, and then to move to decision maker to make this solution to become something really to be done, not uh, because otherwise, uh, if, if there is no, I mean, this uh, pulls from the society, it will be difficult also for politicians to choose something which is difficult, at least at the beginning. It's much easier to burn oil. If don't caring about what is going on in the atmosphere, in the soil, with the climate change. But it's really stupid, this. So we have to force. This is my point of view. Eh? Thank you, Luca. From the audience, any remarks, questions, curiosities, appreciation? Why not? <laughs> we are tired, I'm afraid. Oh, there's a question. Ada. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, uh, more than a question, it's a small curiosity. If you have an idea, general data on the average production in relation to the high income or low income countries, because I imagine that it varies quite a lot. I don't know, maybe if you know the average production of uh, um, we. So in Italy, I mean, uh, we produce uh, roughly 12 kilos of wheat a year per tax. 
and we are side well, yeah. This is with the uh, chapter 22. Mm -hmm. For sure, all countries will be flat. For sure, sometimes they have to deal with much higher amount of this wheat because we export the wheat to their countries, like China. And uh, I mean, now it was a astonishing for me to see that the number of patents increased in China. That means that I'm investing uh, in the circular economy, not just producing uh, for an apple, but also trying to recycle them for waste, which is good. Uh, I mean, they try this. Do you think that's the scenario that this is uh, something in China has been developed uh, uh, already since uh, the day? Uh, you know, when you have a economic system that is controlled from the top. Maybe easier for persistent things. Huh? Uh, yeah. But the target for the recovery of electronic uh, waste should be 65. So the European Union is on, uh, would like to recover 65% of electronic waste that this should be separately collected. Huh? Uh, yeah. I think that every country, uh, even the most advanced uh, one, ones, are now uh low this uh, this target and Yes, about such uh, types of uh, statistics, you can consult the website uh, of the, in Italy of CNC, Centro Nazionale di Coordinamento RAE, and in general, at the global stage, uh, the e-waste uh, UN statistics website. Well equipped with uh, all such um, kind of data, for instance, comparing uh, how much uh, do we produce in terms of e-waste compared with the added value in terms of uh, uh, earning? And you can consult these two websites. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone? No? From the audience connected in the internet? No, with a hand. We have decreased to 23. So, <laughs> please. Yeah, come here. To allow them, otherwise they will not hear. They desire you here and to participate. Thank you so much. Okay, hi. <laughs> Um, I want to say thank you so much. It was really interesting, um, especially for me, uh, because I'm from different majors. So I was questioning myself whether it would be understandable for me enough or not. But it was really understandable and very broad and like common ideas, which I can follow with. So it was really interesting. Thank you so much. And um, I really enjoyed all the presentations. Thank you. Uh, yeah. a, a, a lot of industrial production in your state and uh, among the Great Plains, but only the um, agricultural production. So you're putting a, a real uh, mixed experience. Um, okay, uh, other questions or remarks? It's time more or less to close uh, this first meeting. I have the pleasure to thank um, so much uh, even uh, the, the third speaker, uh, Alessandro Sartorello, and the case studies of uh, um, Laffert uh, SPA. Uh, all materials will be put at your disposal, uh, the slides um, and even the recording of this lecture, this webinar. Uh, don't forget, please, to sign the, the sheet for participants that are enrolled and formally enrolled. We are taking some pictures for uh, the mm, documentation, the final documentation and reporting. So don't feel uh, fear <laughs> or scared by uh, Flamur, uh, our technician, Flamur Bayani. 
And okay, and of course, uh, Marco, Luca, thank you so much. Even to the staff, technical staff, Ada, Susanna, Flamo, and also in my old friend, uh, Nicola. <laughs> and know if you are still connected or no. Yes, and, thank you. Yes, uh, still live. Moderator, <laughs> humble moderator. And See you next appointment um, on March. Don't forget to participate on 14 March, even uh, another Thursday. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.